On the banks of the River Thames and about a 30 minute train journey from the centre of London, this is Hampton Court Palace, another one of those fantastic royal historical palaces in London or on the outskirts of London which was favoured by Henry VIII. In this video, we're not only going to show you around Hampton Court Palace, we're also going to show you the amazing gardens as well and tell you about some of its history. So we're going to kick it all off in Henry VIII's apartments and it's going to start here in the Grand Hall. Or oh, by the way, those are all tapestries that are hanging around underneath the stained glass windows. Just how look how big those are. When Henry VIII took over Hampton Court Palace, and we'll tell you more about that a little bit later, he had the whole thing refurbished and also expanded for his royal court. Part of that expansion was this room, which of course is the Great Hall, and this was built between 1532 and 1535. And just look at the ceiling beams and the stained glass windows, they're absolutely incredible. So as we look around Hampton Court, let's bring in some of the amazing history. So the actual building was owned by Thomas Worsley, who was the Archbishop of York and Chief Minister and a favourite of Henry VIII. And he took over the site of Hampton Court Palace in 1514. And it had previously been the property of the Order of St John of Jerusalem. Over the following seven years, Worsley spent 200,000 crowns to build the finest palace in England at Hampton Court. Now today, little of Worsley's building work actually remains unchanged. The best rooms in the whole palace were reserved for King and his family. And Henry VIII stayed in the state apartments as Worsley's guest immediately after their completion in 1525. In building the palace, Worsley was attempting to recreate a Renaissance-style Cardinal's Palace. Architectural historians assert that the palace shows the essence of Worsley, the plain English churchman who nevertheless made his sovereign the arbiter of Europe and who built the furnished Hampton Court to show foreign embassies that Henry VIII's chief minister knew how to live as graciously as any Cardinal in Rome. As you can see here, the Great Hall would have been used for many things, including massive feasts that were held here and also entertainment. But hold on to that thought because we're coming back to that very, very shortly. Right, this is all attached to the Great Hall and this is where some of the great trophies would have been presented. As you can see, the stag's heads, which would have come from Richmond Great Park, which is not a million miles away from here. To Henry VIII, the Great Hall was the most important room in the whole palace, and here the king would dine in state. But also, it took five years to complete, and so impatient was the king for completion that the masons were compelled to work throughout the night by candlelight. So whilst we're having a look at these fantastic tapestries hanging in this room, Worsley was only to enjoy his palace for a few years. In 1529, knowing that his enemies and the king were engineering his downfall, he passed the palace to the king as a gift. Worsley died in 1530. I'm saying nothing, but Inspector Clouseau might have solved that case. Anyway, right, moving on to the beautiful palace. Just look at these windows here. Next to the Great Hall, this room was set aside for the busy page boys for both eating and also sleeping in, so they could be at their king's attendance whenever it was needed. And the furniture you see in this room is all in the style of the time of Henry VIII, 16th century. If you're coming to Hampton Court Palace, let me tell you, this is brilliant. They have different events that are going on. And what you're seeing here is a play that is going on and being played for the queen who's sitting in the royal throne at the end. And it's A Midsummer Night's Dream by William Shakespeare. And they're enacting one of the scenes. Now, as you're sitting around comfortably with your legs crossed on the floor, be prepared. Because as you can see, there's lots of costume changes there. And they're for some of the people that are, as you can see, sitting around. And it's not just reserved for children. Yes, I got to play a part as well. So it's a great thing to get involved in. But keep an eye out for the different times, the different things that you can attend and get involved in. It's brilliant fun. Oh, and if anyone asks, I was a lion. Rawr. 
there you go see i've still got the part now right okay we're looking back at some of the old pictures and some of the original work here there you go cardinal warsey on the wall there and one of the wives on the previous wall and then as you go through this would have been the grand entrance into the hall So we've shown you tapestries and now we're showing you paintings and one of the amazing things about coming to Hampton Court is not just seeing the palace as it was and lived in by the kings and queens of the UK but also seeing some of the artwork as some of the original artwork here is incredible and we're going to show you more of that as we go through the tour. So you know how much we like to give you that extra information so let's tell you it took me a good four hours to do a tour of Hampton Court Palace which includes the gardens as well which which are going to show you later in this video but if you really want to spend time really take it in then you do need to make sure you allow yourself plenty of time to come down here and do it i would say it's not a morning or it's not an afternoon thing it's one of those things that absorbs most of the day and it is absolutely incredible the other thing which is brilliant about hampton court palace there is no particular order in which you have to do it they also give you some headphones so you can listen to the history of the place and take that in but the bit that I would really recommend is do it in your own time, in your own steam, and make sure you cover everything off because everywhere you look, there's something historical to take in. So here, this was the area of the Privy Council where the Privy Council met. That's where King Henry VIII would have sat, where they made big decisions on things at the time, including the execution of the two queens. And here on the walls, you've got copies of documents for the beheading of Catherine Howard, which was decided once again within this room. And next to it, you have the divorce documents, which are for Anne of Cleves. And then you go from divorce papers to this marriage certificate with Catherine Parr, which happened here at Hampton Court. Now I'm showing you different bits and pieces here from Hampton Court, but there's a lot I'm not showing you because you need to come down and see it. It's a fantastic place to come. Now, most people have a family tree where they sort of just draw it. Not Henry VIII, no, he had this amazing painting done, which is the family of Henry VIII. And then it tells you who all the different people were. The level of care of some of the paintings here are absolutely incredible. And if you look at these, these are all original paintings which have been looked after, restored and brought back to life. And they are absolutely incredible. In fact, I did have to ask someone that worked here if these were originals. And apparently that's one of the most commonly asked questions because the colors just pop off the canvas, which is quite incredible. Now this painting of Henry VIII in this room with the gilded ceiling, just look at the detail on there, is absolutely incredible. But it's one of the few paintings that were done of Henry VIII, which is most lifelike. So it's worth coming in here and having a look at this. So here we pop outside and this is the second inner court, also known as the clock court for what we're about to show you, which is this magnificent clock. Now, this is an early example of an astronomical clock and it still functions today. And the clock not only shows the time of day, it shows us the phase of the moon, the month, the quarter of the year, the date, the sun and the star sign. This is certainly one of those places here at Hampton Court you want to come and linger in because it's absolutely incredible. If you get a beautiful day like this, you can take in the Tudor chimneys, which are up there as well. Oh, by the way, that clock also tells you the high water at London Bridge, which was really important for those people visiting the palace from the Thames side because, of course, they were coming from London, which, of course, was by barge and was the ideal way to get here. So they knew what was high and low tide. And just look at some of these incredible things which have been put on the walls here. Because it's a royal palace, look what they've got out in one of the quadrangles. Yep, a celebration of King Charles III around the fountain. Now here, we go into the Georgian section, and here you've got a sort of fairly empty ballroom, but just look at some of the costumes which would have been worn by the yeomans at that time, with George on them, as in GR. 
You can imagine in rooms like this in the palace, great balls taking place on this wooden floor. Okay, as you move through, you've got some incredible artwork. So once again, you really need to allow the time to take in what you actually see here because it is absolutely incredible. Some of these paintings which date back to the 1600s. And nothing says like this is your fireplace by putting your coat of arms on the top of it in marble, which is incredible. Right, as we look around the room, not only have you got brilliant artwork on all the walls to take in, and just look at the size of some of those as well, we're also going to focus on the dining table, because on the dining table is a collection of serviettes in all different animal styles, and they've been folded specially, which is quite incredible. Aren't these absolutely incredible? And I have enough trouble just folding my serviette in half. So while we continue our look around the Georgian themed section, I can tell you more about the history of Hampton Court. So during the Tudor period, the palace was the scene of many other historic events. In 1537, the king's much dissolved male heir, the future Edward VI was born at the palace, and his mother, Jane Seymour, was to die there two weeks later. Four years afterwards, whilst attending Mass in the palace's chapel, the King was informed of the adultery of his fifth wife, Catherine Howard, and then she was confined to her room for a few days before being sent to the Sion House and then on to the Tower of London. Now, legend claims that she briefly escaped her guards and ran through the haunted gallery to beg Henry for her life, but she was recaptured. It's really hard to know where to look because not only have you got fantastic tapestries hanging off the walls, also some incredible paintings as well, but you've got all this amazing artwork on the ceilings as well. And this was a former queen's bed, but the actual top from the canopy is actually missing from it because it's currently being renovated. After the king had died, Henry VIII had died in January 1547, he was succeeded by his son Edward VI, and then by both his daughters in turn. Now it was Hampton Court that Queen Mary I, Henry's eldest daughter, retreated with King Philip to spend her honeymoon after their wedding in Winchester. So now you've got the introduction to different types of vases and also different types of porcelain, all back through the ages. And what's incredible here is you've got all of the tapestries, but one of the tapestries is actually over the door, so you go in and out through it. Now here we're back at Fountain Court, for call that for obvious reasons, but we're going to show you some of the artwork around the square, which are those circles which are going across the top layer of windows, and we're going to show you those in more detail in just one second. But of course, after Mary, she was succeeded by Elizabeth I, and it was Elizabeth who had the Eastern Kitchen built, and interestingly enough, you can go in there today, and it's a public tea room. Rather nice. Now at Hampton Court, you've also got a royal chapel, which is here, and you can't film inside it, but let me just tell you, you can go in and you can walk around it, and it's beautiful, and you can also stand above it and look down onto it as well. So do whatever you do, make time to go in and out of those, and once again, you can go at your own speed and your own pace. And actually, if you're staying locally for a couple of days, you can really take in Hampton Court Palace. Earlier, we looked at some of the places that Henry VIII would have used, including the Great Hall and also the area where his Privy Council met. Now, when he was travelling, he had a court of about a thousand people, which was quite vast. And of course, they had to be fed and watered. So next, we're going to take a tour through Henry VIII's kitchens. If you fancy being transported back through time here at Hampton Court and back to Tudor times, just come and make sure you find Fish Court, which is this really, really narrow place and sort of a narrow street with all of the different doors around this. And just come and stand in here and just take in the ambience of Tudor times. It really does take you back and make you wonder how the world lived at that time. Thank you. 
And also, if you really want to enjoy it, if you're going to go forward, always make sure you look back and take it in, because when you then swing round, you get the whole of the ambience of the court once again. And just look at those chimneys, all in the Elizabethan style. So we're now in the heart of Henry VIII's kitchen and just look at this room. Now, when I walked in here, I thought I can smell an open fire. And when I did this, it must have been about 25 to 30 degrees. It was that hot when I filmed it. And yes, they've got open fire in here. So you get a real idea of what the place not only looked like, but what it smelled like as well with things cooking. I really hope you're enjoying our tour of Hampton Court. And yes, we haven't even been out in the gardens yet, which is just incredible. So make sure you keep watching for that. Now, if you haven't subscribed already, you know what you need to do. And also, can you do us a big favor? If you're loving the video, give it a thumbs up so we can spread this out to more people so that they can love London as well. Thanks. Also, just continuing giving you a bit of a historical flavour to Hampton Court, on the death of Elizabeth I in 1603, the Tudor period came to an end, and the Queen was succeeded by her first cousin, twice removed, James I, and the House of Stuart started. Note that bag over the back there, do not eat for the King's mouth only. James I continued to use Hampton Court as his residence, and it was here in 1604 that the palace was the site of the King James's meeting with representatives of the English Puritans, also known as the Hampton Court Conference. And while an agreement with the Puritans was not reached, the meeting led to the James's commissioning of the King's James Version of the Bible. King James was succeeded in 1625 by his son, who was Charles I, and Hampton Court was both to become his palace and also his prison. It was also the setting for his honeymoon with his 15-year-old bride, Henrietta Maria, in 1625. Now, when you get to Hampton Court, there are maps easily accessible as well as guidebooks and various other things. Whatever you do, follow them. Otherwise, you'll miss little gems like this, like the place where they were storing the tableware and here where they've got the crockery all by the side of the kitchen, but not adjoining the kitchen. And how about this? Fancy coming and look in the wine cellar? You can just imagine how much this was used during the time of the royalty being here. You can imagine with this many barrels, any big meals held here at the palace would have been, well, quite some riotous affairs. Okay, now we go to the art gallery, which was created by William III, and we're gonna to go to his private residence very, very soon. But there's a number of great pieces of art as you come through here. So once again, time is definitely something you wanna make sure you've got an allowance for. But in the next room, which we're about to go into, you're gonna see the Cartoon Gallery, which is here. Now, it takes its name from the huge preparatory drawings or cartoons of the Acts of the Apostles by Raphael, the great Italian Renaissance artist. William III created this room to display them with the intention of aspiring English painters and the King's Privy Council, his chief political advisers who also met there. Now, the original cartoons can be seen in the Victorian Albert Museum in London. And funny enough, we did film them when we were there and we covered the Victorian Albert Museum. And I'll put a link to that video up in the top right hand corner. So if you want to whiz in there at some point, you can do. These were all copies specifically made for William III. Now, if you want to make an entrance into your apartment, how about having this as an entrance? Yeah, quite spectacular, isn't it? And that's only the staircase going up, let alone inside them. What's incredible about this artwork is it doesn't matter where you admire it from, you keep seeing something completely new and you can stand here for 20 minutes as I did and keep finding new things to look at. It is incredible. So once again, plenty of time here to take in the entrance to William III State Apartments. Now here, we're in one of the great halls, and just look up at the artwork that they've got there, because it's no ordinary artwork. Yes, it's guns and various types of knives as well, all put on display in various forms. 
Let's go back into the history of Hampton Court Palace, and following King Charles's execution in 1649, the palace became the property of the Commonwealth, presided over by Oliver Cromwell. Unlike some former other royal properties, the palace escaped relatively unscathed, probably because it was a bit outside central London, and while the government auctioned much of the contents, the building was mainly ignored. Following the restoration, King Charles II and his successor James II visited Hampton Court, but largely preferred to reside elsewhere. By the current French court standards, Hampton Court now appeared outfashioned. It was in 1689, shortly after Louis XIV's court had moved permanently to Versailles, that the palace's antiquated state was addressed. The rooms here are all at the back of Hampton Court Palace and overlook the magnificent gardens and we'll give you a quick view of that in just one second as a sort of taster before we do go outside into the gardens and have a look. But just look at these tapestries and just look at how the colours pop out and how well restored these original tapestries have been done. It's also worth pointing out when you get here, you get an audio guide to go through all of the different rooms and they tell you about all the different paintings, the tapestries, etc. So I can't emphasize enough, if you get a chance to get down here, come and spend a good time down here and use that guide because it really does tell you. Now, how about these for views over your back garden? Not bad, eh, with a nice fountain. Now, right at the very end, those gates, that borders on with the River Thames. So that's where people would have arrived on their barges from London to come and visit the palace. More to come on that very soon. So at this time, when Louis XIV's court had permanently moved into Versailles, at that same time, England had joint monarchs, which were William III and Mary II. And of course, it's in William III's area that we are in in his apartments we're in at the moment. Now within months of their accession they embarked on a massive real building project at Hampton Court and their intention was to demolish the Tudor Palace, a section at the time, and replacing it with a huge modern palace in the Baroque style retaining only Henry VIII's Great Hall. Not bad for a bedroom, hey? If you're a king, this is where you'd be. This is William III's bedroom, with tapestries hanging around it. I guess not just used for lovely paintings or lovely pictures, but also for insulation as well. And just look at the ceiling colours. To get the best redesign for the palace as possible, guess who was called? The eminent architect, Sir Christopher Wren. Now, where have I heard that name before? Anyway, he was called upon to draw out the plans, while the master of works was to be William Talman. Now, the plan was for a vast palace, constructed around two courtyards at right angles to each other. Wren's design for domed palace bore resemblances to the work of the designers, both architects, employed by Louis XIV of Versailles. It's been suggested, though, that the plans were abandoned because the resemblance to Versailles was too subtle and not strong enough. At this time, it was impossible for any sovereign to visualise a palace that did not emulate Versailles' repetitive Baroque form. Here, we're on the ground floor here at Hampton Court Palace, and this would have been the area where William III would have entertained various other people. You've got different dining areas and also different lounges as well as with his own writing rooms here. Across the back of the palace, you've got this long corridor with lots and lots of different statues. So as you walked into the palace coming from the back from the Thames, it would have been a really impressive way to come into the palace. During the refurbishment work, which was ordered, a lot of the Tudor Palace was replaced and Henry VIII's state rooms and private apartments were both lost. And new wings around the Fountain Court contain new state apartments and private rooms, one set for the King and one for the Queen. And each suite of state rooms was accessed by a state staircase. 
There is no doubt that Hampton Court Palace is also famed for its garden, so now we're going to take you for a view around the gardens. We'll continue telling you the story of Hampton Court Palace and how it grew, and we'll also tell you about the gardens as well. But we're going to start off here with our garden tour, looking at the Privy Gardens. So this is the view that you got up high, looking down from William III State Apartments. After the death of Queen Mary, King William lost interest in the renovations and work ceased at the palace. However, it was in Hampton Court Park in 1702 that he fell from his horse, later dying from his injuries at Kensington Palace. Now He was succeeded by his sister-in-law, Queen Anne, who continued the decoration and completion of the state apartments. And on Anne's death in 1714, the Stuart dynasty came to an end. Queen Anne's successor was George I and he and his son George II were the last monarchs to reside at Hampton Court. Under George I, six rooms were completed in 1717 to the design of John Vanborough and under George II and his wife Caroline of Ansbeck, further refurbishment took place. Since the reign of King George II, no monarch has resided at Hampton Court. And in fact, George III, from the moment of his accession, never set foot in the palace. And he associated the state apartments with a humiliating scene when his grandfather struck him following an innocent remark. However, he did have the great vine planted here in 1763, and also had the top two stories of the great gatehouse removed in 1773. Now here you've got lots of different small gardens. This is the Knot Garden and I can tell you the smell of lavender is absolutely beautiful. Here we've got two also two smaller gardens. Both of these are called the Pond Gardens and as you can see you've got a pond right there bang in the middle of this garden and then in the slight garden next door there you go. And that's the pond there between those two lovely decorated hedgerows. So the building you can see behind is called the Banqueting House and the best view of all of the back of Hampton Court Palace and the just the whole estate is here, right by the side of that. Looking over the gardens, you've got the greenhouse which has got the great vine in it and that's the back of the pond gardens and the back of the palace that we've been walking around. And then when you go through this door in this wall here, it opens up into the vast gardens that you've seen before. So do make sure you come around this bit because it's a little treasure trove that I bet you not many people get to because they just sort of come out here. And how about that for the view from the back of the palace? And that's almost the same view you'd get if you were arriving from the Thames and walking through the gardens through the middle path. Pretty impressive, eh? Okay, speaking about arriving from the Thames, there it is on the other side of the gate. So let's take a look down there and see what you would have seen when you were coming in. From the 1760s, the palace was used to house grace and favor residents, and many of the palace rooms were adapted to be rent-free apartments with vacant ones allocated by the Lord Chamberlain to applicants to reward past services rendered to the Crown. How about this for a view once you get off the boat and you get into the palace grounds? What a fantastic view. Now over to the left you've got the large hedge and within that you can walk right through the middle of that and it's a beautiful covered area. So if you come here on a hot day it's a great place to come, get out of the sun and there's also some benches in there as well and it also gives you a lovely look back over the privy garden here. To complete our history of the palace, in 1796 the Great Hall was restored and in 1838 during the reign of Queen Victoria the restoration was completed and the palace was open to the public. 
visitors arrived not only by boat from London, but also by the brand newly opened Hampton Court Railway Station, which opened in February 1849. And I can tell you the service is still going now, and it's only literally half an hour from Waterloo Station, so it's well worth coming down. This is the Great Fountain in the Great Fountain Garden. And that's a fantastic view back at the palace there with those incredibly sculptured trees. So instead of having a great place to walk or drive, they designed a great canal known as Long Water, which was excavated during the reign of King Charles II in 1662. The design, which was radical at the time, was another recognisable influence from Versailles and was laid out by the pupils of Louis XIV's landscape gardener. And also what's interesting is the people on the bridge and the pontoon there are trying to clear away the silt which you can see right across the water. The gardens around the outside of the palace are absolutely beautiful and the flowers they have at all times of the year are well worth stopping and enjoying. And also, as you saw earlier, they've got figurines around as well. So do take your time to take some pictures of those because they are lovely. This Royal Tennis Court here at Hampton Court Palace was built for Cardinal Wolsey between 1526 and 1529 and Henry VIII played here from 1528 and the court is still home to an active tennis club and in 2015 it was actually closed to visitors for major restoration works. Now during the 17th century various improvements were made to the court. One of the first acts of Charles II after his restoration in 1660 was to order the extensive refitting of the Tudor Tennis Court. And as you can see, it's a different type of tennis they play here. It's called real tennis. And there's been a world championship at the Royal Tennis Court on five different occasions. Now, as you get out and about, you're on the other side of Hampton Court Palace. And this is in an area called the Wilderness. But what you have got over in the Wilderness is the world famous Hampton Court Palace Maze. Engineers, once you enter the door and go through the hedges, will you ever get out again? Well, the good news is, yes, we did, but I actually spent about 20 minutes in here just walking round and round in circles and eventually found the way out. Now, the good news is it's not as massive or as complex as lots and lots of people tell you, um, but on a busy day, you're probably going to bump into lots and lots of people. But as you can see, it's rather daunting because the hedges are, what, six and a half to seven foot high. And then the funny thing is, as you start walking around, you start following the same people, hoping they've got a clue on their way out. Guess what? They haven't. They ain't got a clue at all. And this is a very common view. Yes, a face full of hedge. Anyway, I would really recommend you do it because you can then say you've done the Hampton Court Maze. That's, of course, providing you make it out and boast to everybody else. OK, right, we're back in the wilderness and there's lots and lots of different places that you can go, including they've got the garden here at the side where they do a lot of home growing as well. So with this area set out as a kitchen garden, you can imagine back to the times when the people working in the kitchens would come out here and pick the fresh fruit and vegetables to take into the kitchen for the king. Now, as you can see, it's extremely quiet in here. And the reason I think it's for that is it's nearly exit, but you have to go a little bit further. So by the end of the day, people are thinking, do you know what, I've seen enough, and they don't come over here. Yet, they're missing out on this fantastic area. And some of the flowers, once again in here, are absolutely beautiful. Also, the other thing I love about this garden, not only do you have to walk around it, but you can walk right through the middle on the paths as well. So you can really get up close to all of the stuff that they've got on here. And as you can see, they are keeping it going as a working kitchen garden. And before you hit the exit, you've got this amazing rose garden. Just look at that. You can almost smell it through the screen.
Something I've noticed with both here and also Kensington Palace, which we filmed and bought you not long ago, is outside the actual palace, they have these areas of wild flowers, which are beautiful, but also just looking back at the palace with these wild flowers in view, just gives you a fantastic finish to your visit. So whatever you do, make sure you walk through the path that comes through here as well. If you want to get a good view of Hampton Court Palace, get it from the bridge, which you will um, take when you're walking to the station, because you get the view back here of Hampton Court Palace, plus also of the Thames in the foreground. And you can just imagine the boats arriving in the times of King Henry VIII. So I really hope you've enjoyed our video on Hampton Court Palace. Let us know what you thought in the comments down below and what was your favourite part of Hampton Court Palace. Do let us know. Now, we've also, as I said earlier, been to Kensington Palace as well. And I've put a link to that video up in the top right hand corner. So I'll see you in there.